Hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. Boy, it is windy outside today. I mean, I am just, it is, it has messed up my hairdo completely. <laughs> now I look like the real Backyard Professor. Yeah, baby. Okay, hey, let's go on with another Bobby Fischer chess game, shall we? We're starting to get into meatier games. Fisher is picking up speed now. Uh, this He plays Owens. He's black in this particular game. King's Indian defense. Uh, this is a great little game for a number of reasons. G6, he's going to being Keto is bishop, bishop g7, because that's what you do in the king's Indian defense. That's why you're being Keto the bishop, and you don't push this pawn to here. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. All right, enough shenanigans. Come on, get serious. This is chess, man. Checkers, you can goof off. Chess, we must be serious. I'm sick and tired of telling myself to get serious, man. Get serious. Okay, now we're having fun here, because... In my quest to go through all of the tournament games of Bobby Fischer to improve my chess, and, and to share them with you because you want to improve your chess too, although you don't need to to play me. <laughs> I'm trying to give you my best, I'm telling you. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not as good as you guys, but I'm working on it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be beating you here in a while if you guys lay off like I did for the last four or five years. That was, God... Oh. Don't do that. I mean, I mean, if you're gonna, if you want to be good at chess, get good at chess right now in your youth. It's much harder later on. I'm just saying. I, I'm really sincerely serious on that one. I, I am really mad. I, I couldn't help it. But anyway, I'm back, and so let's just. You can't cry over spilled milk. You got to move forward. So that's what I'm working on doing, is moving forward. So. We're going to go through all of Bobby Fischer's games. We will be able to study the openings, the middle games, and the end games of one of the greatest in ever. That's what makes this series so exciting for me personally. So let's see how he handles this King's Indian uh, opening. And White will be in Keto, his bishop also. And now d6. Fischer never gave up the fight for the center. Knight B to D7 here, uh, and then White will castle, and so and then the E5 push. Yeah, yeah, he's hitting the center. He always does in his games. From here out, he he just gets stronger and stronger and stronger in this regard. It's fabulous to see. I've been playing some games ahead of time, cheating, trying to take notes and all that jazz. <laughs> it's starting to get exciting. I'm going to start kicking out more of these simply because they are so good. Now, he bumps the E. His opponent is not... I mean, this is King's Indian defense, and these guys know enough about chess. Even though they're young, at least Fisher is young. Uh, oh, I don't have my book handy right now. I don't think... I don't know how old uh, Owens is, but Fisher is still a 13-year-old. He's still very young. Now, E takes D4. Yeah, there will be a center pawn exchange, and the knight takes D4. So we can see that the square that white owns is the D5, right? And then he's got the bishop backing up. Yeah, the knight's there, but that's, that's not con of consequence. At this point, the square Fisher controls with his knight and pawn is E5. But d5 is definitely whites at this point. Right? That can change depending on play, of course. So knight takes d4, knight c5, yeah. Yeah, Fisher, Fisher gets the knight c5 in and rookie one. Yep, grab the uh, partial file. It's technically not a partial file just yet, but it could be. Uh, a5. Coming up, make sure the wing is taken care of in h3. Notice the pawns around the king are moving. Kind of interesting. Uh, later on, three to four years up the road, I suspect there will be very few of Fisher's opponents who do that. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking Fisher had gotten so strong by the time he won the first U.S. Open Championship. From that point on, 
Man, you didn't mess around on the king side like that. Not with the fee and kettle. The bishop is a good guardian, that's true, but against Fisher you need eight bishops. And I'm not kidding, we will see, we will see. I've been going ahead of time and I'm really, really getting excited for this series. Okay, make the next move, dude. Rookie eight. Again, won't let it go unchallenged, nor should you. If you can at all help it. There are times where you have to give up the file, but if you don't have to, then for Pete's sake, don't. That's the essence of great chess. Uh, that is a piece of the puzzle. A piece. I've, I've overemphasized it in my videos because it was so electrifying when I first realized that and discovered it that I've never let go of it. And it has worked well for me and against me. <laughs> it works. It doesn't matter who you're playing. So, And Fisher will... And, and, you know, I criticize him moving pawns. Yeah, well, Fisher's doing it too. He's bumping against the bishop, though. Uh, he will limit the activity of the bishop here. So, yeah. Every rule in chess is made to be broken depending on the position. And that's why Silman makes a big deal about reading the positions. And I'm no good at that, but I'm working on it also. I'm no good at any of this. That's why I'm going through this series, hopefully, to help me get better. And it's fun to share with you guys. It really is. So, Bishop F4, Knight at F to D7. So he drops this knight back at this point. Let's see what Fisher's got cooking here. Bishop E3, he bumps his bishop back, guarding his knight, and now C6. So it looks to me... Like this move, uh, Fisher is preparing to challenge this square. I mean, he is challenging the square, yes. But it's clear white owns the square. I, there's way more support for the, uh, e, or the d5 than there is against. So Fisher might be trying to solve that. We shall see. Queen d2 comes up. Knight e5... Look at the square Fisher's looking at with his knights. That's kind of interesting. That's deep in white territory, right? So uh, Fisher may have some real good counterplay in controlling the center coming up real quick. We'll see. But that is, uh, look, there, <laughs> that's a fight right there. That is, that is called chess fighting 499. <laughs> We're way past 101 where I dwell. This is way up. In fact, this is doctorate degree stuff here. So this is pretty good. Pretty interesting to see this uh, set up. And Queen will go to E2. And uh, Fisher pushes this A pawn again. Very interesting how he is the center. See, nothing's going to really travel through the center. There are no open diagonals. There are no open files yet. So nothing's going to come zippity doo down through the center from either player. So Fisher is going to the wing. The center is, I'm going to use the word secure. Uh, at least it's not, there's no danger to either player's king at this point or any tricks against their queen's right, because of open diagonals or files, so Fisher appears to be trying to get something going on the wing, and, and that's what you do. That's, I mean, that's good chess. So let's see what comes of this. Rook at a D1, center, centralize those rooks. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not bad. Queen A5, developing every piece, putting every piece into this battle again fighting on that wing because his center is pretty solid at this point. So this is turning up. This can become epic really quick. Yeah, this can become epic really quick. This fight. Notice, and I know I've overdone this, and, you know, it's just what I do because there are so many players still who need to understand, I'm, I'm talking to me, you know, when you point, you have more fingers pointing back at you when you're pointing. So that's what I'm doing. The kings are really not vulnerable. 
So this is not a kingside attack position. I know, that's generic, it's general stuff, but it's stuff we have to recognize. So it's worth pointing out again. So this position doesn't call for kingside attack. Fisher appears to have more space, well not appears, Fisher has more space on the queen wing, and so he's putting power over there and, and thrusting that pawn. That makes sense, right? It really does. So it, it's fun to know that, that uh, the higher echelons of chess can make sense to us. And that's what's cool about this going through Bobby Fischer's tournament uh, games. This is great stuff. Good stuff for us to know. Look at this. F4 hit that knight. Pow. Yeah, man. I mean, this guy is playing some chess now. Uh, interesting. Uh, the wing movement of Fisher is being countered. Well, I mean, it's on the king wing, but it's hitting the center. And that's the proper way to react to a wing side attack is hit the center. So we have two players here. Fisher's not just bowling his opponents over. This is great chess. Knight E to D7. Uh, okay, temporarily he moves back. That doesn't mean his center is wiped out, though. It, I don't think yet it's a crisis. No. King H2, there's a question mark there. They go, what the heck? And, th and then queen... Uh, queen 2... What? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I wanted to show you this. Yeah, instead of... Okay, this was his move, King H2, and the suggestion was he needed to do the preventative move queen to c2. I mean, it's obvious Fisher is pushing that a pawn up to destroy the white queenside position. So a better way to prevent that would have been to put the queen to c2. Yeah? That would have made it so that... Oh, Gadfrey, where was that queen? Queen was at e2, yeah. It would have made it so white is less vulnerable on the queen side once Fisher's power arrives, right? But instead he went to h king h2. Yeah, that's what the note was. Yes, and then Fisher pushed the pawn a3, and here we go. This, because of the way white played it, Fisher does get a chance to destroy this uh, queen side. And now white went queen c2, and now the question mark is here. Uh, a better play now is the bishop down to here. And when Fisher takes, then the bishop takes. And it really minimalizes uh, the, the problems with white's queenside position. That would have minimalized it better than the way white played it when he went to queen c2. And I know there's a lot of little nuances and subtleties. There's billions of them in chess. This is why we keep playing and practicing and studying, so that we can at least get a little bit in our minds and improve our game, yeah? So, so we're seeing how a little bit of uh, inaccuracy here on White's part. Fisher will take the pawn, and now instead of having the bishop there to retake, he retakes it with the queen, okay? So this is the situation after uh, queen takes b2. Okay, let me, let me do this real quick. Knight b6. Okay, this is the situation after the 21st move. You can see both these guys are playing really good chess. I mean, God, I'd love to play like either one of these guys right now. It seems like lots of power on the queen side, doesn't it? White's uh, pieces appear better evenly distributed than Black's, so White has to take care of the queen side, it appears to me, because now it is weaker. Weak squares have developed. The dark square complex are, is weak on the queen side, and Fisher has a dark square bishop. Fee and Keto are aiming at the queen side, and so White has to really pay attention here. Fisher could have a dynamite spectacular attack coming up. But, I mean, there's no 
uh, I don't think either one of them are in crisis at this point, but it's building. It's building, and now uh, bishop f1, support that queenside pawn, the isolated pawn. Yeah, you've got to support that isolated pawn. Boy, that would be a wicked uh, knight fork on the bishop and the queen if the knight can come to here, yeah. So that's why he pushed that bishop. Now it makes sense. Because really, seriously, this position is truly complex. Uh, you can see, I mean, wow, there's a lot going on. Uh, not a lot of exchanges, not a simplified version. Every piece is still on the board, and they are really maneuvering for a better uh, place. If you were white and you were asking, well, I mean, dang, what do I do now? Uh, I, I've got my rooks in this. Uh, I suppose I could move my knight over and open a file, but there's no real good spot to put the knight in order to open the file. You could have a target pawn, you know, the rook on that. But, I mean, what do you do? What do you do? It makes sense why he chose this move instead of a knight. I, and I was just using that as a superficial, just, well, what, what do you do as an illustration? We understand now, okay, I get it. He wants to protect that isolated pawn. Because that knight fork is so tough. And see, I, and the reason I'm repeating this a little bit to show you some of the nuances is because this is what I need to start putting into my games. Because I don't play this good a chess yet. I would love to. I'm working on it. As you all are. But, yeah, this is really getting hairy here. So, bishop f1, yes. And now, knight from b to a4... So it is a queen side. We knew that from two moves ago anyway, but it is a queen side. There's no question now. Hitting the queen, hitting the knight. Fisher appears to me to be wanting to force uh, some exchanges to manipulate the weaknesses in the queen side. It's a great strategy. It appears to me anyway. Knight will take the a4, of course. Uh, you can't get passive here. And instead of uh, exchanging with the knight, putting the knight on the rim, the knight is much more effective here. He's got a target here, right? From this center outpost. So instead of losing that outpost, uh, you can see how that weakens the knight influence, can't you? Right? So rather than exchange with the knights, Fisher took the knight with the queen. And now you can see the difference in the position had he taken the, with the knight instead of the queen, this is a much better setup. Looks like to me. So, so this is getting good. Now, queen does come way over here to g2. All of a sudden, white shifts. You can see his queen side is really shattered. And rook takes e4. And this... Was this question... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there was a question mark on this move. Uh, Fisher... I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of rooks on open files and using the open files. So, but... Uh, there is a better way here than using the rook on the open file. That doesn't mean the principle is wrong. The principle is right. However, the better exchange was with the knight, and then bishop to g1, and then bishop to d7. And had Fisher done that, he said white's position is in ruins from that point. But that's not what he did. So, so Fisher missed a... Fisher uh, did this what can we say, inaccurately, I'll, I'll put it that way. By exchanging with the rook instead of with the knight, he had a chance to really put uh, white on the ropes, but this gave white, what it did is it enabled, the notes, it enabled white to have a better counterplay. Yeah, and you know, that's a tricky subject. It's a subject that Yusupov talks about an awful lot, and I need to get to that. 
uh, to advance past the three pillars, which I think is a good starting foundation, right? It's not the end-all be-all, but it's a good start for us beginners and intermediates. Uh, but you got to learn how to not give your opponent counterplay and not White starts solidifying his position. And the rook comes back down to e8. He still has the file. They're still contesting the file. The partial belongs to White, and this one is contested. Pinning the uh, bishop to the rook, but it's not like the rook is hanging, so it's not that uh, critical at this point. Rook came to e8. Now knight takes c5. Yeah, take that central knight, man. That, that's a great knight to take. It really is. It makes sense that he took that knight. Doubling up his pawns. Uh, I don't know if that's a huge crisis at this point, but things are whittling down. Now we can see the board start opening up. Both of them each have the bishop pair. As a general rule, bishops are better in the open field. So this could get very interesting. And now bishop takes c5 opening up it up even a little further for the white bishops. Fisher brings his bishop to e6, and rook comes to b1, taking that file. He's got a target down here on the b7 pawn, and now the bishop takes c4, opening it up even further for the black bishops. So they're eliminating the center pawns. They're opening it up wide open for the diagonals, and wide open for the files. Here is where tactics can come fast, thick, swift, and in a hurry. If you're a bad player like me, I usually get tactified right here. <laughs> in positions like tactified. Hey, that's a new word. Woohoo! Tactified. Hey, that'd make uh, tactics fied. That'd make a good handle. Wouldn't it? Uh, whatever. Whatever. Focus. Focus. You know how he did it on thirteen monkeys. Focus. 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 Yeah. Focus. Did you ever see that movie, The Thirteenth Monkey, or The Thirteen Monkeys? Crazy movie with Brad Pitt years ago. Fun movie. Okay. Now where was I? Again, I mentioned the files. Things have really opened up. And he's going he's gonna to exchange. Yeah. Yeah, rook takes check. Rook takes e8. No more check. Now, Fisher has the file at this point. And rook b4. What a tactic. Did I not say tactics could come fast and furious? I did say that. If I rewind this tape, I will catch myself saying that. So here we go. We are in the thick meat of the beginning of the end game. Potentially. Potentially, that P word. Uh, Fisher exchanged the... Bishop, tactics, like I said, tactics, right? And he took the queen with the rook. And he took the queen with the bishop, kind of a nifty little move. And now, of course, the king took the bishop here. And now it's looking pretty drawish, isn't it? Now things have whittled down, and it's not looking really good. Rook e2 check. Now, at this point, he's got another note. Yeah, he, he said, okay, now, now I kind of did something similar to this in one of my games. I mean the rook on the open file. That, that's just too tempting. It, it is, I, I'm telling you. I'm not following Fisher. I'm saying instead of doing this... The note in the text says that bishop f8, uh, bishop takes f8, and king takes f8. In other words, getting rid of the bishops would have made the winning chance easier for black. Why? Why would that have made... Why? Let's take the bishops off. That would have been the position. 
that would have been an easier win for Black. The question is, why? Can you see why? The pawns are even on this side. We are definitely in an endgame here, and the pawn majority is with Fisher, and he has a pass pawn. And that's why it would have been better. Now, in later years, we will see Fisher doing this. Fundamentally so. So, I mean, this is an early Fisher. I'm not, uh, I'm not getting hard on him or, or, or uh, ridiculing him at all. That would have just prevented more counterplay. It would have taken him into a winning endgame. Instead, he chose to, and I, I'm telling you, I'm, I love rooks on open files too. So, here we go. And king comes to f3. And rook to c2. And he said rook to b2 is more precise. Now that's interesting because he doesn't hit a target. And I, I'm, I'm trying to attempt to develop my target consciousness. So I thought c2 was better because he's hitting a target. But the text says b2 is more accurate. So let's see what it means. Let's see why that would have been more accurate. Rook a8 check, king h7. Okay, so, and now bishop e3. And b5. And this is a question mark. Can you see why? Now, this is a great lesson for me because I've done this in games with some of you. And, and so I need to... I need to straighten out my inaccuracies also. Uh, this is definitely inaccurate because what it did, and he will show you with the next move, this is not the correct move because it opened up the seventh rank for white to have counterplay. Yeah. And that, I'm, I'm going to tell you once again, I am so not kidding when I say the seventh rank is deadly powerful. If you can possess your opponent's seventh rank, by all means do so. Yes, you notice that both players know that principle. That could become one of the next pillars, the fifth pillar past the fourth pillar of tactics, is the seventh rank. Unfortunately, Bobby opened it, and so now this again gives White more counterplay, right? You can see why now. You see how now. So Fisher has to come back here. You can't let you can't let your pawn majority uh, get taken. You are up two pawns, right? But now you can see both sides get to make threats because Fisher did not exchange those bishops. Yeah, and he opened up the seventh rank. So. This is going to get tough. Well, rook back it to a8 check. Uh, and now bishop f8, and, and they, they said, no, nah, that wasn't the way to do it. Because now here comes the troops. f5, and that's an exclamation point. Whew, okay, here comes the battle. Fisher went g5. And then he went f6, and completely paralyzing the black king side. And that's no kidding. I've had that done to me, and I hate it. I hate it. This happened in Fisher's early career. I'm not sure if in the later years we'll find out as I work through the tournament games if he ever let this happen again. And I'm seriously not going to try to let this ever happen to me again because that just kills you. So White is on his toes, and he is improving his position. He's actually making it so that he can get into an attack, which is really interesting. So Fisher has to play tough here. Rook c3, king e4. Look who gets to centralize their king as a fighting unit and who doesn't. That's really important. Look whose bishop is pinned and whose bishop isn't. Yeah, Fisher's kind of, whoo this is getting rough. So rook c4, check again. He's trying to keep the initiative. And then king went f5, and they said, no, that wasn't it. That wasn't the way to do this. Rook c3, and now king e4. He comes back. And rook c4, check. And now at this point, they could have had a draw through repetition. 
and white goes to here. King d3. And it was at this point that they both agreed to a draw. Now the text note is really interesting here at the end of this draw. White should have played on. He drew too early and, and uh, Muller gives the Muller gives the rundown. Rook a4 Rook d8. Now this is going to benefit White. White could have played uh, stronger and better in the end game than Fisher could have had he kept playing instead of drawing. We're going to see how. Rook a4 check. King now f5 is a great move. Rook uh, c4, Muller says, and now h4. Blam! And now White's winning! Fisher would have gone down in defeat, and he says at this point, he said, he has good winning chances. So, what? so anyway, through tinkering with it, uh, you can see for yourselves that White had a winning position. So there's your Backyard Professor Chess video. It's a great Bobby Fisher game. We are beginning to see him get a little bit stronger, but the nice thing is, so are his opponents. And so his games are picking up in steam and speed. That's what makes them so important and yet fun to go through. So, you guys be good. Or I could say do good, be well, have fun. Or be good, or do good, be well. Be, be good, do well, have fun. The point is, life is great to live. Live it, man. We are so fabulously blessed to be able to study this chess game together so not this specific chess game but chess in general come on get the hint <laughs> and i appreciate playing all of you i um listen I, I love playing you guys chess but i have had some very very powerful chess players while i'm lamenting at the club that i just suck and I make so many blunders and all. I've had some very strong chess players tell me, well, that's because you're playing it wrong. You're doing this wrong. You are playing too many games. You will never be able to get in depth and improve your chess if you're always playing 25 and 30 games all at once because it, they become shallow and superficial and you don't spend enough time studying the positions. And that's true. Even with three-day casual correspondence, that's not enough time. If I have 20 of you, I've got to play. So I'm thinning my games down. Don't be offended if I decline games for another week or two. Some of you I'm accepting. Some of you I'm not. I hesitate to say this because I really don't want to make anybody mad, but I'm going to end up making a few of you mad, and I apologize in advance. I promise I will get to where I can play every one of you. You're going to be far better off playing Odoker in our club, or Juzernim, or Juni, or uh, Merlin, or Phoenix, or some of the really, really fab or Deep Draw. God, Deep Draw just beats the snot out of me every time I play him then you are going to play me, but, you know, you want to play the Backyard Professor, and I do want to play you, and I do want to give you a good game. I mean, when I win, I want to win because I did it good. When I lose, I want to lose because you did it good, but I gave you a good game, right? That makes sense. So don't be offended. I know some of you have written privately to me, and you're kind of miffed. That, what? What are you rejecting me for? Why are you declining to play me? Are you dodging me? Are you scared of me? Yes, I'm terrified of every blasted one of you. Now, now that we got that over with, <laughs> uh, just be patient with me. I'm going to try to thin down some of these games. And I'm telling you, I do want to play rated chess, but not right now. Not for the next three or four months. I don't give a flip about improving my rating right now. But there's no point in me continually playing rated with you guys who are 1,700 and above and taking my rating down to 600, right? So... I don't want to play rated games right now. 
I'm not trying to cause a problem, hit the casual button and I'll play you some casual games. Those are the games where we can talk a little more together and try to work things out, give each other take backs a few times because obviously I blundered or obviously you blundered or whatever, you know. But chess takes patience and it takes time to learn and I want to learn it good and I want to have a lot of fun with it. And if I constantly keep getting trounced in rated games, uh, there's no point in me playing rated games against so many strong players. There's just no point. You guys, you guys are where I want to be. I'll never get there if I keep playing just everybody who is way stronger than me rated games. I want to play casual. I don't want to, to lose my rating. My rating is inflated anyway. You know, this is my ego talking. I don't want to see a rating on my name of 700, and I'm just not going to play your rated games <laughs> for that reason. I need some time to improve, just like all the rest of you. So let's go casual, and let's have a ton of fun. That's what I'm looking for as we improve. So anyway, that's enough lecturing. You guys have a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next Backyard Professor Chess video. And do not be mad if I keep declining you. I've declined a couple of you about eight times. Don't be mad at me. I'm trying to give everybody a chance to play me. And that's why I keep accepting other people. And so that's, that's how that's working. So, I love all you guys. Be good. Have fun. Do well. Work hard. Study well. Get lots of sleep. Drink lots of water. And be patient with me. I'm only one of me. Thank goodness. Could you imagine the world with two of me? Oh, what a disaster.